Hello everyone, <clears throat> and uh, my name is Danny Rod, and I'm the Chief of Gastroenterology at UH Parma Medical Center. Thank you for inviting me to speak today about this um, difficult, somewhat difficult topic, but important, uh, particularly in the world of reflux disease and anti-reflux surgery. Um, Minority findings and management strategies in ineffective motility and fragmented peristalsis. I have nothing to disclose. Um, ineffective esophageal motility was uh, first defined <clears throat> by Leite and Al back in uh, 1997, originally replacing the terminology of non-specific esophageal motility disorders or NEMD. In fact, based on conventional manometry, uh, peristaltic contraction of less than 30 millimeters at the distal esophagus is associated with impaired bolus clearance and therefore um, this was initially defined as more than 50% of the swallows having a contraction of less than 30 millimeters uh, of mercury. Fast tracking to the Chicago classification in 2015, the latest Chicago classification for high resolution manometry, um, the term ineffective swallow was defined as either failed or a weak swallow. A failed swallow was defined by a DCI less than 100, and a weak swallow was defined by a contraction of the DCI between 100 and 450. So an ineffective swallow was considered either failed um, or weak. Fragmented peristalsis why, was defined by a contraction that had a normal DCI, so it has to have an effective swallow but a large break in the 20 millimeter mercury isobaric contour, as you can see here. So it is a normal swallow with a large break. And moving on to the hierarchical classification of the Chicago uh, uh, version 3, you can see that both ineffective esophageal motility and fragmented peristalsis were classified as minor disorders of peristalsis, where IEM was defined as 50% or more of the wet swallows being ineffective, and ineffective being either weak or failed, and fragmented peristalsis was defined as 50% or more of swallows that are fragmented. And when we say fragmented, we mean effective, so they are not ineffective um, swallows. Now, IEM is more of an expert opinion diagnosis, and therefore this could change and this could have different variations. For example, are more frequent ineffective swallows associated with a worse clinical outcome? As I said, the word ineffective is, is either failed or weak, and it's 50% or more. Is it different if it's more than 50% um, or, or, or not? In fact, um, Heisten and Al uh, defined the term IEM alternance, which, um, as you can see, there are normal swallows in between ineffective or weak swallows, and IEM persistence, where there are no normal peristaltic contractions. Patients who have IEM persistence were found to have a weaker lower esophageal sphincter, more advanced reflux disease, and somewhat worse response to PPI. And therefore, this may prove that IAM persistent is actually a more advanced uh, manifestation of IAM than IAM alternates. The second question to be asked, are failed swallows more relevant than weak swallows? And in fact, they are shown to be, yes, more relevant. And as you can see here, swallows with a DCI less than 100 classified as uh, failed swallows had a much lower bolus clearance as compared to swallows that were uh, classified as weak or normal. So bolus clearance, bolus clearance may be more impaired uh, uh, in patients who have failed swallows and therefore this could produce more dysphagia as opposed to um, weak swallows. Provocative testing, particularly multiple rapid swallows, has been recently introduced as a standard during uh, high resolution manometry protocols nowadays. In our institutions, we use multiple rapid swallows on all patients undergoing um, esophageal manometry for dysphagia. This is usually performed by administering five 2cc swallows rapidly and then evaluating the contraction after the swallows. As you can see on the picture on the left, 
the five repetitive swallows produce a very strong normal contraction with the normal DCI, as opposed to the image on the right where multiple repetitive swallows fail to produce a contraction um, um, that is uh, uh, effective with a good contraction bigger. This has been also defined as a ratio of the multiple repetitive or multiple rapid swallow DCI ratio over the mean single swallow uh, uh, DCI. If it is more than one, this usually implies an adequate peristaltic reserve. And an adequate peristaltic reserve has been shown in certain studies, and we'll talk about this, particularly to affect the rate of post-op dysphagia after uh, from duplication for acid reflux disease. However, it is proposed that because of uh, the for better reproduci reproducibility in patients with IEM, that a minimum of three MRS tests are performed in patients with um, IEM. So the symptoms IEM, IEM is a minor motility disorder and therefore 30 percent of patients undergoing high resolution monomaly for whatever reason can have IEM. The most commonly reported symptom is usually dysphagia followed by all the other symptoms of, of acid reflux. However, it is important um, to know that there is significant controversy about the causal relationship between IEM symptoms such as dysphagia and the severity of the IEM. In fact, it may be actually more Ball, impaired molars clearance may be more responsible for dysphagia than the actual ineffective esophageal motility. IEM and GERD have a mutual influence between each other. GERD can contribute to development of IEM and IEM can contribute to development of GERD. The most frequent motility disorder found in patients with acid reflux is in fact hypomotility or ineffective esophageal motility and fragmented peristalsis. And this has been shown by several studies. For example, you can see here that the prevalence of esophageal hypomotility parallels the severity of GERD, where patients with erosive esophagitis or Barrett's esophagus had more ineffective esophageal motility as compared to patients with NERD or normal um, um, acid reflux. Fragmented peristalsis has also been shown to have the association with higher acid exposure and subsequently delayed reflux cl clearance in patients with chronic GERD. So this study by Ribolsi et al. demonstrate clearly that weak peristalsis with large breaks, i.e. fragmented peristalsis, is more relevant to abnormal acid exposure than actually frequent weak peristalsis with outbreaks. So patients with fragmented peristalsis have less bolus clearance in GERD and therefore more dysphagia. This goes with our observation as poor clearance, more dysphagia, more GERD causes the esophagus not to work well and impede the clearance as the disease um, <clears throat> progresses. Now, other causes of ineffective esophageal motility include rheumatological problems such as systemic sclerosis, Parkinson's, or medications that can actually reduce the smooth muscle contraction um, um, of the esophagus and therefore result in ineffective esophageal motility. Now, the topic of ineffective esophageal motility and anti reflex surgery remains a big controversy. ARS or anti-reflux surgery is a very important and frequent treatment for patients with chronic GERD. And the choice between partial and total nissen from duplication as related to the presence or absence of ineffective esophageal motility remains a controversy um, uh, as of now. And, and there is meta -ana this meta-analysis, for example, shows that partial from duplication causes less post-op dysphagia, low risk of reoperation with similar reflux control compared with total duplication. However, till now, we don't have clear evidence that esophageal clearance improves after surgery and for which patient. But the presumption that the clearance will improve if the insult of ongoing acid reflux is removed suggests that it's better to have a tailored approach uh, as opposed to a good missing from duplication for everyone. And therefore, this remains very controversial. In fact, this very important study from 2002 um, shows that there is clearly no difference in post-op dysphagia, regardless of what type of 
fund application was performed and regardless of preoperative is ineffective as a vaginal motility. So you can see that one year after anti-reflux surgery, there is no difference in patients who had normal motility prior to surgery or ineffective as a vaginal motility. In fact, after one year, 95% of the patients who had normal motility versus 91% of the patients who had ineffective residual motility had excellent outcome, and none of the patients required dilations or had severe dysphagia. Therefore, there is no merit in tailoring anti reflux surgery based on the presence or absence of um, um, uh, ineffective residual motility. The story with the magnetic sphincter augmentation of links is a little bit different. This is a, as, as you all know, is a more recent development in the treatment of GERD. And this device mechanically reinforces the function of the lower esophageal sphincter. In order to achieve appropriate swallows, you have to assume that the esophagus has normal peristalsis in order to push through that um, um, magnetic device and open it when the patient swallows. So therefore, the safety and effectiveness of this device has yet not been established for patients who have good and significant esophageal motility disorder. And therefore, I would like to see, for example, a DCI of at least 450 average before referring someone to uh, um, get an MSA or an adequate peristaltic reserve as evidenced by multiple uh, rapid swallows. Now, the final point about anti-reflux surgery is the resolution or the creation of IEM after anti-reflux surgery. This um, nice study clearly shows that there are different phenotypes in ineffective esophageal motility following fund duplication in patients with GERD. While 14% of patients had persistent IEM, there were 8% that had resolved IEM and in fact, 19% developed new IEM after antiflex surgery. But as you can see, that the cohort that, that developed IEM had a significantly lower cha DCI change as opposed to the cohort that had resolved a persistent IEM. And most importantly, this, this study done by the group by Gewali, the same study showed that the importance of MRS uh, response in the different phenotypes. As you can see, the cohort that had persistent IEM or that had developed IEM had significantly lower DCI augmentation um, following multiple rapid swallows compared to those who had no IEM. So, and in fact, the, the cohort that had resolved IEM was not different than the cohort that had no IEM. This parameter shows that the normal MRS or MRS augmentation can actually predict the formation of IEM and can also predict lace or operative dysphagia. Finally, a few words on the treatment of IEM. As we talked about, it should be based on the mechanism. There are certain lifestyle modifications that we advise all our patients with dysphagia, eating a prior, chewing well, drinking water with food. Chili or that contains capsaicin, which is present usually in spicy food, has been suggested to increase amplitude of esophageal contractions in patients who have an effective esophageal motility. Um, other pharmacological therapies suggested include procalopride and mosapride, which are 5-HT4 agonists. Macrolides have very weak evidence. They usually work better in patients with gastroparesis. And bispirone is um, um, somewhat of a promising uh, drug that can help to increase esophageal contractions. But overall, the treatment is very, very um, difficult and challenging. So the take-home points, IEM and fragmented peristalsis are disorders of minor motility disorders. IEM is defined as more than 50% of or more uh, swallows that are either failed or weak with the suggestion that failed swallows are advanced with more, are associated with more severe phenotype of IEM. Fragmented peristalsis, 50% swallows that had large breaks but are effective swallows. There is a very strong association between IEM and GERD, and it appears that IEM is more prevalent in patients with more advanced reflux disease. Patients with IEM can have different complaints, but usually dysphagia occurs in patients who have defective or delayed Boland's clearance. 
Effective treatment is tailored towards improving acid reflux control. It is unclear or controversial whether preoperative IM can predict post-op outcomes after anti-reflux surgery or dictate which type of anti-reflux surgery um, should be done. There is currently no available data on patients who had IAM and underwent uh, links or MSA. And multiple repetitive swallow is a very important protocol that uh, can help identify peristaltic reserve, which may help predict the risk of postoperative dysphagia after anti-reflux surgery. Bisperone may be a, a promising pharmacological treatment. Thank you so much uh, for listening. I hope you guys are staying safe and enjoy the rest of the summer.